Wow, what a, how, a number of people showing up. That's really wonderful. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I would like to thank the CCC in advance, uh, in the beginning for uh, having us here. And uh, we are, of course, bits of freedom. Um, I would like to start out with a, uh, with a uh, well-known quote. The quote goes, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. Um, on behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome amongst us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. It's a quote from uh, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. By, uh, it was written by Barlow in 1996, and you probably know Barlow. He was one of the founders of the EFF. Unfortunately, and this was to, ex to be expected, those weary giants of flesh and steel, they did not really listen, and uh, the consequences are massive. Now, we always thought that the technology was um, one step ahead. Take, for example, file sharing. Um, where you first had Napster, Napster made file sharing really, really big, um, but it did have a single point of failure. There was one company with one single database, and this database told you, you can find this file on this computer, and you can find this file on this computer. So after a couple of legal cases, Napster was brought down. Then there were, then there were alternatives, like Casa, um, but even those had some flaws and were taken down in the end. And now you have BitTorrent, which is still there, which is not a single network anymore, and uh, which is a lot harder to take down. So technology was really improving all the time, but policymakers are catching up. And um, this, is really a big, this, is, this is really a big problem for our digital freedom, because uh, those policymakers come up with all kinds of measures which have an impact on our digital freedoms. Take, for example, um, internet filters. There are several countries in Europe that already have an internet filter in place and where the government tells you which information you can see and which information is not accessible for you. In countries outside of Europe, uh, governments have taken this even a step further. Uh, some countries don't really have an internet anymore and it's more like an intranet. And policymakers also uh, think of uh, the current times as being the dark ages. Um, they think that uh, the law enforcement agencies are no longer able to catch criminals. But the opposite is true. You know this, I know this, because we cannot do anything anymore today without leaving traces. We've never left so many traces in our daily, in whatever we do in, uh, in our daily lives. So, all these measures from the government, all these laws, all these policies, they have a huge impact on our digital freedoms. So the battleground is shifting. It's not only technology anymore, but it's also policy. And that's why uh, the political activism also needs to change. There needs to be a lot more political activism. And thankfully, this has been changing in the past few years. Um, we all know the, the big protests of ACTA, uh, with hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets protesting against this treaty and trying to defend their digital freedoms. But we need a lot more of, uh, of such uh, um, political movements. We need a lot more political activism. So what we want to do today here is try to, um, to, um, to name a few of the elements which uh, make political activism a success. This is not our own experience. It's the experience of organizations like EDRI, uh, like EFF, like Quadrature du Net, Panopticon, and many more. Um, but it's also the experience of Bits of Freedom. So let me first second what Reo said. I think that it's an honor to be here. And it's not only an honor because it's such a good atmosphere, but it's an honor because of you, because of the people which, in my opinion, will shape the future of technology and with the future of technology will shape the future of the information society we live in. And that's why I think it's so, so important that we talk about this topic today. So we are Bits of Freedom, and Bits of Freedom is a Dutch digital rights organization. Reo already uh, named some others which are active on this field, such as European Digital Rights Initiative, Panopticon, and in Germany, Digital Garage, Courage, sorry, <laughs> um, and others like Digitale Gesellschaft. And in the past three years, we have had some experience uh, in 
changing policy. And here's the good news, that in fact it can be changed. That although the battlefield is shifting, and although we are seeing that policymakers are trying to restrict our digital freedoms, we can in fact fight back. And one important example of this was ACTA, which was an epic victory. I remember clearly people talking about this last year, saying that it would be an uphill battle, but we won. And this was amazing. It turned out that the European Parliament, in fact, listened to us. And this is something we have to keep in mind. And another epic victory in the Netherlands, which we will refer to a lot, is debt neutrality. Um, the Netherlands is the first country in Europe and the second country in the world which actually has net neutrality enshrined in law, and we will talk a bit about how this works. So let me first tell you a bit about Bits of Freedom, and then we'll get to the uh, points. So Bits of Freedom is uh, six people, basically, six FTE, six full-time employees, and um, approximately 300 volunteers who, one way or another, uh, help us with our work. We act on a Dutch level, so national level, and on a European level, uh, together with other organizations. And what we do is we, on the one hand, try to influence policy by advising politicians, and on the other hand, trying to influence policy by um, informing people and campaigning and giving them tools to defend themselves. And what we're going to talk about today is the campaigning policy part. Rayo will start off with the first of the five points which we think are important if you want to kickstart your own movement for whatever reason you uh, feel or are passionate about. But before I start with these um, six points, I think we've identified. Sorry. Uh, before I start with those six points, um, I would like to say first that uh, there is no um, a magic silver bullet. It has no one way to do this. Um, the experiences we are um, talking about today, these are our experiences and the experiences of organizations like ours. But there are probably many other ways to do this. So this is not the way to do it. Um, and also, I th think that most of the, the key elements we, are, we will be naming, they, are, they will sound very obvious to you. And this is true, because they are, they are logical. But the thing is, we, are, we tend to forget those when we're uh, in the heat of the fight. But let me start with the first one. And that would be, you need to have a clear goal. Without a clear goal, you will have, well, there's, little, <laughs> there's, uh, there's not such a big chance on success. Let me, let me illustrate this point by, uh, by giving you two examples. The first example would be of this, of um, Gina Crossley. She's a mother and she uh, writes a lot on her uh, blog, which is, uh, which is named feministbreeder.com. And she posts a lot of images, she posts a lot of photos of her breastfeeding her kids. And she posts those to her website, but also to Facebook. On one of those photos, you can see her breastfeeding her one-year-old and the one-year-old has a piece of bacon in her hand. This photo is being banned on Facebook. I don't know why, and if you know, please tell me afterwards, because I'm really curious, but I don't really understand. So Facebook um, took down the photo and uh, disabled her account. She could no longer log in. After a few protests, uh, the account was enabled again, and the photo was only uh, put back online after three weeks. Meanwhile, another photo of her breastfeeding a kid was taken, taken down. And of course, um, uh, Facebook does have a legitimate interest. And of course, uh, Facebook has, uh, they, sh they should be able to tell um, what is going on on the network, uh, on their own network, of course. But on the other hand, Facebook is becoming this important that it's becoming um, a, a platform for public debate. And if you start taking away images then, this will have obviously an impact on the freedom of speech. So there needs, it's a delicate balance and there need to be, Facebook needs to have a good policy on this. But Facebook does not have a good policy on this at this moment and they're definitely not transparent about it. We are worried about this, but we have not been able to change it. 
and I think that one of the reasons why we were not able to change it is that we didn't really have a goal. We didn't really um, um, uh, think of the aim, well, what we were aiming for, and we didn't list our demands. And because of, partly because of that, uh, Facebook still has this shitty policy. But let me give you another example of how, how this can be different. Last year, sorry, this year, we had elections in the Netherlands again. And these are wonderful moments because so many things are happening and politicians are speaking out suddenly. And um, there we thought it's good to put our demands, uh, to list our demands. So we made an Internet Freedom Manifesto. It listed 11 articles which said um, we want politicians to think about reform copyright. And we want to make sure that the, that the politicians are thinking about how to enforce net neutrality effectively. Then we were waiting a few days for... Oh no, sorry, let me tell you some, one thing else. The, uh, this Internet, man, uh, Internet Freedom Manifesto, um, it doesn't really help if it's just on our desk and that's it. So we ask our constituency to send this Internet Freedom Manifesto to the political parties. And I'm pretty sure they've seen it, all of them, because uh, one of those political parties sent me an email asking me to stop it stop the campaigning, because they had seen it so many times. So that did work. Then they were publishing their draft uh, election programs, and in those draft election programs they, they tell you what they are planning to do in the next four years. And we carefully, carefully made a review of these uh, uh, election programs, and then it turned out a lot could be changed and could be made better in order to protect digital freedoms. So then we made a list of amendments, we made a list of changes that should have been made. Then we asked political members of those, poli of those parties to discuss these amendments and to have those changes incorporated in the final election programmes. And when in the end the final election programmes were published, we were really happy to see that quite a few of our proposed changes were incorporated in those programmes. And this is really important because this way we could put digital freedom on the political agenda during the elections. But not only during the elections, because the politicians take a position, and this will mean that, they, that digital freedoms will be on the agenda for the next four years. And I think we have been very, very successful in this, because we um, had a goal. We, we set a goal before we started. We wanted to make sure that um, politicians would be talking about digital freedoms, and we uh, thought about, okay, how are we going to do this? And to do this, you, it's not really difficult, because all of you already have a, a good idea on what digital freedoms, on how they should look like, on how they should be protected, and uh, what the government should do, and what the government definitely should not do. So, write it down, and um, make for yourself clear, we are right here now, we want to go there, and this is the path we're going to take. And if you have this in your mind, then you will do so uh, very effectively. Um, and there's one thing which I already mentioned here, is you need to be prepared. Yeah, so you have this goal, like you want to, I don't know, destroy the medical health database, which has all your private data in it, and ensure that policymakers will not ever think of reinstalling it again. And you have this goal, and the next step then is what? So we think that the next step is to be prepared. And let me take you back to one and a half years ago in London. On 10 May 2011, during a shareholders meeting of KPN, the Dutch telco incumbent. One of the directors of mobile retail um, of KPN then bragged about to his shareholders about the fact that he was using DPI to analyze the traffic of his users. And with this traffic, um, he could see how many people were using WhatsApp. And on the basis of this information, he made the case for net neutrality infringing policies like blocking WhatsApp and instead charging for SMS. After he told this, it was silent for two days. Investigative reporters didn't notice it. Until two days later, one investigative reporter looked, into the, looked on the video, saw what the uh, director actually did, 
and managed to write a blog about it. We then immediately jumped on it, seized the opportunity, and told our constituency that they had to file a complaint with KPN and that they were actually um, um, infringing criminal law. This went from nothing to something to a media storm in about half a day. And in the end, it was in the 8 o'clock news, in the evening 8 o'clock news, where we gave a quote and we managed to uh, gain momentum. And this momentum we could use later on to form a majority with the parliament to actually push for legislation which could basically um, restrict the use of DPI. And the thing I, I, I take out of this is basically twofold. First of all, the dynamic of the media is very unpredictable. And things can become a hype within half a day, or even sometimes two to three hours. And if you operate in this environment, you need to be prepared for this. And that's the second thing is, we were basically not working on an instinct doing ad hoc stuff. We, this was something we were working on for two years already. We had contacts with our uh, policy makers. We were advising them on draft legislation which could curtail this. And we only had to wait for the right moment to get our point across. So that's the, basically the point which we wanted to make also is that be prepared means taking a long-term view and thinking for yourself, like, we're here now, we want to go there. This will take approximately two to three years. That's basically the time frame you have to talk about. And then within these two to three years, make a plan for yourself. And this plan will involve different um, steps. Firstly, framing, and we'll get to that later drafting your, uh, uh, creating your position, so like really trying to clearly articulate what you are actually aiming for, drafting legislation if that's what you want, or drafting policy, and then talking to policy makers and stakeholders, and we'll get to that later on. So that basically brings us to the next point. Yeah, but you already briefly mentioned it, actually. Uh, because, uh, like Otto already told, um, on May the 12th, there was only one news outlet saying something about KPN's uh, DPI. And um, we were the first ones to jump in. And this is really important, because we were the first ones to explain what KPN actually was doing. We were the first ones to explain what DPI means, what deep packet inspection uh, entails. And we were the first ones to explain the concept of net neutrality. We were the first ones to explain, okay, an internet user should have the freedom to choose to do whatever he likes on the internet. It's not that a company should tell you, uh, you are not allowed to use WhatsApp or you're not, you're not allowed to use YouTube or any other service. You should be the one who, has, who, who can choose. And this worked because we were the first ones, and because we were the first ones, we were able to, um, uh, to put that concept uh, into the minds of people. And if a policymaker would uh, hear other arguments, would hear counter arguments, he, this policymaker would always compare this to our uh, arguments. And that's where you have a, um, um, a good advantage. So be early is very, very important. And if you're, if you're being prepared, then you can seize the moment when there is one. Um, another thing which already uh, was mentioned once is you need to frame your message very well. Uh, picking the right frame is very, very important. And um, I want to illustrate this with another example. Um, in the Netherlands, it's the same just like everywhere, sexual abuse of children is something, is something of a hot debate. And politicians, some, well, maybe not sometimes, sometimes they, uh, they are more concerned about their own image than about the actual problem or solving the actual problem. So this is the same in this topic as well. And um, the policymakers uh, were were uh, had a proposal for an internet filter in the Netherlands. And, um, well, I don't have to explain to you that a DNS filter doesn't really help. Um, you can go around that one very, very easily. 
Um, we were first trying to attack this problem by telling the government that internet filters, they, they, they are bad and they will have um, a negative, con uh, negative effect on uh, digital freedoms in the long run. But that didn't really work. That changed once we started to use a different frame. At one, moment, at one point in time we said, okay, you should act, you should not look away. And this is a frame we were uh, borrowing from Mogis, which is a German organization. Thanks for that. Um, and by using this frame, we were able to change the debate completely. We, could, we were able to, to tell, okay, the real problem is um, the distribution and the production of, sexual, of images of sexual abuse of children. And if you want to solve this, if you want to solve this problem, you should not um, 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 hide those images, but you should um, prosecute the perpetrators and you should identify the victims. And once we were telling this story, the debate was fairly quickly done. We were winning. We were winning. The proposal for an internet filter is off the table, and since then it hasn't been back. So it's really, really important to pick the right frame. It's really important to think about how you bring your message. And picking the right frame is very, very difficult. Uh, we are struggling with it, uh, well, maybe not on a daily basis, but very frequently. Um, if you want to pick the right frame, the best starting point is the problem of your opponent. And it's not, uh, you should not use their, uh, you should not think about their frame, but think about their problem. So in case with the internet filter, you should ask yourself, what is the problem they're trying to solve? And then you think about the images of sexual abuse of children, and then you immediately know an internet filter will only hide it. It will not solve the problem. Once you have thought of a frame, then you need to test it. You need to talk to people around you. You need to talk to your parents, to, to, to your friends, to, to everyone around you, and test it. You need to see if the frame, if it will stick, if it will resonate, if people will remember it, if there are a lot of counter-arguments, and if there are none, if the, if the frame is taken, over, taken uh, by your friends and, and they are using it for their friends. A good frame will uh, propagate like a virus. It, it, you will put it out there once and then it will slowly get around. Um, and it's also important to um, not think of, uh, the frame doesn't really need to touch the, the, the fundamental issues. Um, uh, you, you should use something which, which, will, uh, which people can identify with. That's a lot more important. Um, so a frame is really, really important. I th maybe it's even the, um, uh, the most uh, important thing we are doing, because if you pick the right frame, the rest will um, by, go by itself. So and then there are two more points to uh, Yeah, so, so let me get to the last two points. Um, uh, which probably are also self-obvious, but we need to, uh, we need to um, emphasize them at any rate. So, first one is, be understanding. Um, if you want to get your point across, you'll have to know what the legitimate interests of the other party actually are. And I thought that this was actually the most interesting uh, aspect of the process of drafting legislation for net neutrality, because we, had to, we were forced to think about whether there would be uh, certain legitimate exceptions to the rule that traffic should not be hindered, slowed down, throttled, etc. And I clearly remember a talk about net neutrality two to three years ago uh, at this Congress, where people were quite critical about the question whether all traffic should be um, treated equally, and quite rightly so, because not all uh, traffic should be treated equally. So we had to think about whether there were certain legitimate ex exceptions. And why is it important to think about this? Because if you talk to a policymaker, this will be the first question they will ask. Like, okay, well, you know, net neutrality is all very nice, but what about network security? Uh, what about congestion? What about spam or whatever? And how do you deal with these issues? And if you have an answer ready and are able to, in fact, come up with constructive proposals to address those concerns, your story will be much more likely to be adopted by the uh, other party. And the, the way we, di we did this, and I think that this is very generally applicable, is first of all, um, talk 
to uh, your opponent. Opponents are always very happy to talk to you and talk about all the problems they have, and you have to be very critical. You know, Google comes by, drops by at our office, and they and they tell all these problems, and and sometimes we do not really know whether they're genuine problems or not, so we have to ask really critical questions. And this is where the other part comes in. You need to get help from experts. And probably most of you are the experts in this field, so you'll be able to counter any uh, fake uh, arguments they, 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 will, uh, they will have at their disposal. But that's the, that's the second one. And the third one is you have to think of these arguments yourself. Like, brainstorm with your friends and try to think what your o opponent would come up with and try to address the, 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 these concerns. So those are the three things. And then, then the last one, and this is basically something which I think is um, uh, more about sustainability, and this is be focused, remain focused. So you have your goal, you're prepared, you're working on whatever policy and, and, and talking to stakeholders and policy makers and whatever, and you will find that the media will want something from you. And they may want to, you know, a quote on something which is not really related to your field. And it's, it's sort of attractive because being on the television is nice and, you know, giving an interview on the radio is nice. But you have to remember, first of all, that it will dilute your reputation. Basically, the, the common public will not know what you're actually aiming for. And second of all, all the time you invest in doing that is not invested in achieving your goal. And the thing is, you'll get up in the morning and your Twitter stream is filling it, itself up in about 10 seconds and your email box is constantly overflowing. And if you want to remain um, alive and then, you know, and you want to keep your operation sustainable, focus, focus, focus. Don't be distracted. Even though you're passionate about, this, passionate about these issues, this doesn't mean that you have to do everything at once. In fact, you shouldn't because it will make your life a lot, uh, a lot more difficult and you'll burn out in the end. And this is something which activists, uh, a, a, a very serious risk for activists, I think. So, last one, remain focused. It doesn't really help um, that if you've won the war but then you don't have a life anymore. So, that's why it's important. Um, so, let me um, um, uh, make some closing comments. I think the next uh, few years will be very, very interesting years because um, I'm pretty sure the policymakers will step up their effort and I'm pretty sure there will be even more civilians coming up. Um, and it's already, uh, uh, there's already a lot going on. Uh, our medical records are in a centralized database. Um, uh, you cannot travel from A to B without being registered. And there's so much going on already. And on many of those fields, nobody is seriously working on it. And this is really a big problem. And we would like you, to, we, would, uh, we would like to ask you to, um, well, for the, for the issues that are important to you, for the issues you are passionate about, to start a movement, and we will be helping you with it if it's needed. We want to give you advice in, in how you should do that. But for the, for, the, for the issues you are passionate about, start a movement. And if you're not able to start a movement, please be sure to contribute to one. There are many organizations, I already mentioned a few, um, like Panopticon, like EDRI, EFF, Digitale Gesellschaft, and of course, Bits of Freedom. So please um, start a movement or help the others. Thanks. Thank you very much for the insightful talk. Uh, the speakers will now take the questions, if any. Yeah, please. Uh, okay, you will be next. Thank you very much. It's more a statement than a question, because I'm exactly one of those politicians you speak of, and I please you stay uh, a, little, uh, a few minutes after this and let us exchange contacts 
because I'm here to get all those information and all those contacts to bring your ideas into the political process. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I have one question. If you have an opponent, um, perhaps he lives in another world. He lives in a golden cave where he has no problems because he's using some kind of operating system or uh, which has no problem for him because it's all, all problems are solved in his mind. So how do you get your opponent out of his golden cave and come into your world to talk about the problems you think that are important? Okay, so um, uh, one, thing, uh, one thing I found very insightful was that um, at one time at the European Parliament a, a plan was floated to um, install boxes um, uh, with, with DPI uh, in, in every house and, you know, check whether people were doing things which were illegal or whatever. And it was basically just a plan, nothing serious, so you didn't really hear about it. But one seasoned political activist then said, you know, why don't they test this box with all the European Parliament members and try to see uh, if they are doing something fraudulent because it's very important that they spend our tax money correctly, right? So you have to um, uh, change, um, change the plan and apply it to them. And sometimes this works. That's one thing, and the other thing I want to add here is also you need to be prepared again. Um, uh, like data breaches, um, it wasn't really on the political agenda in the Netherlands for quite some time. But then Bits of Freedom started to uh, make an inventory of all the data leaks which were happening. And uh, after one and a half year, we had this gigantic list of, of issues, of, of leaks. And with such a list, then only we could, uh, made, we could make politicians think about the real problem. So sometimes you need to take your time to uh, prove what the problem, that, that there is a problem. Other questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, right. You speak as though there's only two agencies involved in this, which is the politicians and the activists lobbying against them. But it seems to me the final problem you're going to have is the people, if a politician says malicious in some sense, they can spread scare stories and it's who the people vote for at the end of the day that's really going to decide the future shape of the law. Yet we seem to have a problem that the majority of the people don't have any understanding still of um, net issues, nor interest in it. If they see something that's shiny, they'll sign up to it. They don't care if there's any issues with it. Um, do you perceive there's anything that can be done for that, or is it a lost cause that people just don't care about? And do you perceive that that's a gender issue, not gender, sorry, an age issue? Is it that older people, younger people coming up are more aware of the issues surrounding the net, or are they still as they've always been. Okay. So, um, so you're asking uh, basically two questions, I think. First of all is whether uh, the public is becoming more aware, and the second is whether um, politicians are actually, actually listening to, to, uh, to these issues. And I think those are very, very, very much intertwined. And um, as I said, I think that we are seeing a shift of um, the public becoming involved in this and obviously the people who are, you know, massive smartphone users and whatever will be the first to adopt our positions. But these will very quickly be adopted by others. I was very surprised that my um, mother-in-law actually forwarded me an email about a petition by Access about ECTA, and I was like, I didn't know about this petition. And she, <laughs> for one reason or another, um, uh, got, a, got wind of it. So, um, basically, I think that the public is very much aware of it, and I think if the public is becoming aware of it, politicians cannot ignore it, and that's what we're seeing right now with ACTA, and hopefully with a lot of other things as well. 
Yes, and we try to explain our issue to the public as well, of course, not only to the politicians. Any more questions? Hello. Oh, um, I was wondering about how do you try and combat any false information that gets out there? How do you um, also when they say we're talking about we're arguing uh, for the pro side if there's other lobbyists on the other side then who also have experts who may be more mm, false in their statements. How do you combat that? How do you go up against it and make sure that what your information if it's the correct information is the information that everyone's realizing is correct? Well, one important thing is that we uh, put a lot of effort in making sure that our message is correct. So, when we are saying something, people know it is, a, it is the truth. <laughs> people know it's true. Um, and I think that's very important because then people will not doubt your message. If you, so what we do actually is really we put a lot of time in talking to experts, making sure we understand technology, we understand the legal aspects to something, we really understand the problem, and then uh, we say something which we are 100% sure it's true. And I think that's really uh, important. Maybe. Yeah, and, and trying to debunk the, 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 the false information, obviously. But I think it's a very good question, and I think it's something that we will see a lot more in the coming years, because it's so much easier to spread the disinformation on the internet right now. You can start, you know, with an anonymous comment somewhere, and from there build a blogging uh, ecosystem which basically creates falsehood uh, and turns it into truth. And this is something which we, uh, which we need to find a counter strategy against. And I don't really have it because you want to be, um, uh, you want to be honest, basically. And if you're fighting on their terms, then you'll probably lose. So I think it's a very serious question and I don't have a real answer to it. Um, just Hello? Um, just quickly on that, uh, I ran a campaign against electronic voting machines and within a couple of months you can become known as the party that, that is generally truthful and right about things and the other party very quickly becomes known as the party that's continuously manipulating and twisting the truth. Um, about something else you said, uh, uh, or Rio said, uh, uh, um, uh, there's, there's, there's this dichotomy between uh, planning where you are and where you want to go. As you, as you said it, we are, you are at A, you want to be at B. Um, and being prepared and sort of going with the flow if things start happening, which, which um, I think there's going to be much more of the, of the latter than of the, of the former. And I think a lot of activism is over-focusing on the present, is over-focusing on, on what, is, what is already sort of a, a, a result of a chaotic shifting of states. Uh, as sort of uh, as thinking of it as a set state that we need to move away from, uh, it's much more news is much more chaotic. The 24 news cycle, 24 hour news cycle is very chaotic, and the present state is much less fixed than people think. I think if you if you dare to dream, if you dare to step out of the present, and if you just set down what you what you would like to see as a law or or as a policy or. or um, I think there needs to be a lot more of that, a lot more dreaming, even if it's five years into the future, because um, the present situation is, is so, is so uh, uh, the word is overused, but so unsustainable that, that large changes are going to happen anyway, and you might as well think two years into the future instead of trying to move this status quo that, that, that's not going to hold anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think that two years is even very sort of pessimistic. If you want to have something which is really sustainable, then you have to think three to five years ahead. And, and you shouldn't uh, get um, um, involved too much in the media, media cycle, which is really frantically going rapidly berserk currently. Although you cannot live without it. That's the problem. I mean, if you want to create momentum and gain awareness about your issues, you will undoubtedly have to sometimes step into the media hype and also, you know, perform your role. But you will have to be very clear to what you're aiming for and keep the long term in mind. And I think that um, it's not only like in five years, but maybe it's also thinking about what we want to have in 25 years. So uh, more uh, being a visionary instead of 
just trying to uh, influence the law and take into account that it's taking five years. So think not only about, think about the five-year plan, but also think about the 25-year plan. Have, have you ever had encountered problems with a parents who just yeah, don't want to move and well, just uh, can't be persuaded and etc.? Could you repeat the yeah. question? Yes. Have you ever encountered problems with a parents to your position which simply cannot be persuaded because they, there isn't a way which is acceptable to both you and them? Right. Okay, so the question is, uh, do you sometimes have opponents which actually cannot be persuaded because, you know, they are not open to your viewpoints at any rate? Yeah, definitely. And the thing is, if you have the spectrum, there's the political spectrum. On the one hand, you have the people who are very much in line with you. On the other hand, there's the people who you will never convince in any way. And there's this middle part between, and this is the part you're aiming at. And you're trying to create a majority by shifting those towards your uh, spectrum. Um, and the others you can safely ignore because they will not be convinced. And if you feel that you're picking a battle which in which you will not g gain this majority, then maybe you shouldn't do it and invest your energy in other uh, issues. There are some well, questions. In but the back. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh. It strikes me that you focus so much that you focus so much on um, saying, telling the real story and finding out the real truth and uh, t t double checking that it's really right. I am, have an academic background, as you may know. And I talk to politicians and activists and they say, no, in politics, it's all about perceptions. So you have to focus on the story that works best and not necessarily on the, on the tr truth. Well, you, you, you already told your, your position, but what's, what's the answer if they say focus on, on perception and uh, tell the story that works best? Okay. I think if you are doing this for the long term, then you need to focus on the truth. Because otherwise you will be, um, uh, you, you will be uh, identified as a manipulator and someone who is not to be trusted, as, as, as Rob uh, rightly pointed out. But there are different ways of telling the truth. And I think this is where our point of framing is really important. Because you can either say, you know, DNS blocking is not effective because it can be very easily circumvented. Or you can say, DNS blocking is not effective to address uh, the abuse of sexual, uh, sexual abuse of children because, um, you know, the perpetrators are not being uh, 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 jailed. And um, the challenge is to look for a story which is true but also resonates. Hello. Um, one guy asked about how you cope with irrelevant information, but I wanted to know how do you deal with just irrelevant problematics or, you know, bogus problems. Most often, policymakers just expose one part of the, of the problems we may encounter and just offer the right tool to solve it, but the real goal is to set the tool. It's not the problem, and you said at the point that it's a a good way to gain some weight to give better answers to problems that are exposed. But most often, the real problem is what's exposed. It's not relevant. Just like, uh, I'm, I'm very happy you had a you know, victory with child abuse, but most of the time when we do hear, hear about child abuse, it's to hear about uh, internet filtering or something. It's not really about the kids, it's about control. Mm -hmm. There are so many other fields to, you know, to help children in sports clubs or anything. It's, how do you reveal that trick? Um, I think um, it's a good question, by the way. Um, I think um, what we do uh, also a lot is um, uh, find, uh, trying to find the truth. So um, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, determine what is actually behind the proposal. And uh, by doing so, um, this will help you pick the right frame, for example. So it's important on many levels. It's not only important for telling the story, but it's also important to know what is really going on. 
um, and we are doing quite a few, um, um, we do quite a few, qu quite some research in um, in looking in. Okay, this is the proposal, but what uh, what went on before there was this proposal? So what is going on actually? Easy to get in a thanks. <laughs> it's easy to get in a debate, but it's quite difficult to shift a debate. I, I think that most of the time that's the way to go. No, that is difficult, of course, and um, um, uh, but that I think we already mentioned a few times now is that um, it all boils down to one thing: picking the right frame. So you, you have this problem. You need to find out what's it all about, and then you need to uh, rethink about it and start thinking about: okay, this is the problem. But how are we going to bring this? How, how, how are we going to explain this issue? Yeah, and that's a different one. Maybe I can add to this. Um, in com communication theory, I understand that <laughs> there's a way of um, uh, using the frame of your opponent to your own advantage. So if, 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 your, if your opponent says, for example, in privacy, uh, 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 corporations often say something like, you know, um, for us, uh, all these rules make it very complicated to do our, to do our business. The under then you try to identify the underlying value of this frame. And the underlying value of this frame is basically, um, for us, uh, uh, legality and knowing what we're up to is very important. That's the frame. Then you take the counter frame of that frame, the counter value of that frame, and you say, well, you know, for consumers, trust is also very important. This is so you need to you need to be able to uh, to know what you're up to, but consumers need to be able to know what they're up to as well. You know, you use their frame, uh, pick pick the underlying value, use it to your own advantage, and then reframe it and use their argument to your advantage. It's a very theoretical, but you know, take 50 minutes to do this exercise and it will uh, allow you to do some like communication jiu-jitsu or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. We have a question from the internet. So some people are having difficulty understanding how an individual could benefit directly from being an activist. Essentially, what might motivate someone not specifically interested in the common good? Um, the nice thing about our work is that we are working on problems which um, are which have an effect on myself uh, right right away. So if you look at net, net neutrality, for example, um, winning this battle makes it that I have different um, that, that the companies are sending me a different kind of phone. They are telling they are not no longer telling me, okay, if you want to go to YouTube, you need to pay some extra money for this. Um, so the, most of the, uh, or for many of the uh, topics we are working on, there is a direct relationship between um, what I'm trying to fix and my own uh, environment. So for some of the uh, topics, of course, this uh, uh, line is a bit th thinner, I think. But for many of the topics, there's a direct relationship, and that makes that makes it, um, yeah, very easy somewhere and very cool to do this. <laughs> I thought it might be easier to just come to the mic. Um, my question involves the five and 25 year plan that you guys were talking about earlier, uh, simply because it seems like a lot of uh, our recent victories, especially like things like ACTA, were actually more like five month plans and they all came together in one big flash. Um, so what do you guys, do to manage something that rises and falls as quickly as internet culture does? So, um, in addition to what we spoke to, er, what we spoke earlier about, the fact that, that uh, internet can be easily used to uh, turn falsehoods into truths, there's another uh, dynamic which we are currently discovering which makes activism much more difficult, and this is the fact that um, um, that unwanted policy or trying to change policy 
um, it's becoming so much more like a flash in the pan kind of a dynamic. You, you know, you have these swarms going on to something, picking it and picking the carcass empty and then going away. And this is one way to, um, to do activism, but it's uh, the question whether it's sustainable in the long run. So I think this is something where we as organizations, sort of the, the, the leaders of the movement for internet freedom, need to be very aware of we're, whether we're not depleting a resource and depleting the trust of politicians in, say, uh, um, in, 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 in civil society and internet nerd citizenship, whatever. So um, uh, it's something we are very much thinking about, how to, how to do the next ACTA without uh, using up uh, the trust um, we are gradually building with politicians. Yeah, very legitimate question. Good. I have a question. Just a short Hello? one. How do you finance your activities? Very good question. So, um, we're financed via three uh, types of income. First of all, individual donations. Those are uh, uh, somewhat less than one third of our budget. Um, foundations, those are a bit more than one third of our budget. And corporations, and those are like one fifth or one sixth of our budget. And those are mostly um, freelancers giving 500 euros and stuff like that. So we have a budget of 400,000 euros approximately. And um, uh, and yeah, that's about it. And it's probably important to stress that we are using this setup because we want to be independent. So there's not one single big company um, uh, giving us our budget, so we will be very dependent. Uh, we are not uh, getting any money from the government because that would uh, give us some dependence. We have this um, three-way structure because that makes us independent. But then, uh, like, okay, I would like to set up something like this in Germany. So I need money. How could I convince and <laughs> whom? Like, okay, there is already a good example in the neighbor country. Yeah. Who is giving the, who are those donators? Okay, so there are certain foundations which are, uh, are, are, are definitely uh, interested in, in, in becoming more active in this field. Um, uh, and, and, well, you can come to me later if you want to have more information on this. And the other one, which I think is very important, is individual donations really should be a large part of your income because basically those are the people you are defending. Um, so um, whenever there's something like an ad hoc movement, I don't know, you're doing something against ECTA, already start building for the larger, more sustainable NGO kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, you made it. You made it all sound so easy. You just sent emails to the parties. You uh, made amendments to their party programs, and then they listened to you. But um, I can't imagine uh, that it is that easy. I mean, how do you counter the lobbyism of telcos that don't want net neutrality because it's it's a new field of profit they can make, and I don't think they will let this slip out of their hands that easy. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Um, yeah, okay, so um, I think it's not... Um, Easy, I think it's doable. That's something which uh, I hope you can take away. Um, and it requires long-term planning, like two to three years investing your time in it. That's, uh, but then, if you do that, it's doable. Because, and that's something where I think we have the advantage. Uh, Time and society is on our hand. People think internet freedom is so very important to them that if you manage to um, sort of latch on to that and, and, and sort of help build the momentum for internet freedom, it will sort of take care of itself also. So you just need to be the leader of the movement and, 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 and dare to dream. And, and then it's doable. 
We will take the last question. Okay, also my question is, how, how important are insiders or whistleblowers to get information from? Because do you have some kind of bullshit law monitoring or stuff like that? Uh, you, you talked about preparing is so important because preparing needs time. And if um, policymakers are creating contracts or laws in, in, in secret, uh, and you, you can't prepare what you don't know about. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure whether we've seen many inf or much information from whistleblowers which helped us a lot. I don't think there's, a, there's much. But we spent quite some time in doing, for example, Freedom of Information uh, Act requests. And um, of course, the government is already telling, um, uh, does already do press releases from time to time and tells the story in their, with, with their frame. But to know what is going on, actually, you need to do some research. You need to look into the problem um, that, that is there, that is trying to be solved. You need to uh, investigate what uh, actually the government is up to and what, what they are planning and what they are wanting to do. And um, this also takes a, a, um, um, a long-term planning because uh, doing Freedom of Information Act requests uh, before you get the answer, it takes a long, long time. But without those, you can never um, find out what the government is really up to. So that's one way uh, we, get our, uh, we get the information on uh, what actually is going on. Okay. Okay, so this is the end of the presentation. Let's thank the speakers.